trauma should be a reference point, not a resting place. And that's often what happens when they talk about this trauma. It reinforces this pro-abortion lie that somehow you're better off dead. I was adopted out of the foster care system and most of my siblings were. We weren't better off dead, we were better off loved. Ryan, thanks so much for sitting down with me. Oh, it's great to be here with you. You have an incredible story. You told it around the world, you've traveled the world telling it, and you have an incredible ministry that you co-founded with your wife, the Radiance Foundation. And so we're gonna hear about all of your activism and your advocacy, but let's start with that story. Tell me about your sure. upbringing. My upbringing was different than probably a lot of other people. Our family wasn't your typical American family. I grew up in a family of 15. I have six brothers, six sisters. Grew up in a, on a farm in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And we had one and a half bathrooms. And that's important because I had six sisters <laughs> and one and a half bathrooms didn't quite fly. But people often thought, well, it must have been chaos to grow up in a family so large. I'm like, no, it wasn't chaos because pretty much I'm the only loud one in the family. There are others, they're just kind of mellower. But it's really remarkable when you look at all the stories that brought each and every one of us to our family. I was the first one adopted. My parents had three biological children first. Um, mm. I called them the homemade ones. So they were there first. And I was the first one adopted at six weeks of age. I was united with my family. And I am that exceptions case. So when we talk about the issue of abortion, I am the 1% the that's used 100% of the time to justify abortion. And the thing is, especially as you know, being an adult and being a father of four now, it just blows my mind how some people think that the circumstances of our conception change the condition of our worth. And I thank God that my parents didn't fixate on how I came to be. They just loved me into who I was meant to be. Mm. You know, and I had a courageous birth mom who could have chosen the violence of abortion. She experienced the, the horror and the violence of rape, but didn't make me a victim of the violence of abortion. And so instead I grew up loved. And you know, every year there's a new child, a new flavor added to the family. And so out of the 13 kids, there were 10 who were adopted and were white, black, I'm mixed, white and black, Native American, Vietnamese, able, disabled. So many of us that the world would so easily write off. You know, you were unplanned, you're gonna be unwanted, you're gonna be unloved. And it was a lie. And my parents shattered that, that whole myth of the unwanted child. So that's my background. So when people ask, well, you're a guy, why do you care? Why do you talk about these issues? I'm fighting for those who have storylines like mine. I was the most marginalized among the marginalized. So today as a happily married man, my best friend you mentioned, Bethany, uh, and wife, co-founder of the Radiance Foundation, we have four kiddos, two of whom were also adopted. So wow. That's what flows through my veins. That's why wow, it's and so your mother was a survivor of rape, your, bi your biological mother. Yes. How old was she? Well, that's interesting you asked that because I just found out some details recently Years ago, I searched for my birth mom, and this was actually back in 2005. And the search came up negative with no response, meaning that I didn't know if she was alive, I didn't know if she just didn't want to respond, which I would completely understand, right? But I found out two months ago, when I got my original birth certificate, Pennsylvania changed its, its laws, and I was able to get my non-certified birth certificate. And there it was. I saw her name for the first time in my life. I never knew her name. Her name was Sharon. And I found out that she was 21. And the other fact that I found out, which my wife and I were, first of all, we were just crying like crazy because it was just ridiculous to, fig to find out all of this because I've never had this, I never had this information. I didn't know these, these particulars. But her birth date is the same as my birth date. So I was born on her birthday on May 5th. So I've never met her. And I also found out one last thing, which I actually haven't really revealed much. The internet tells you all kinds of things, right? My wife found out in just a few, matter of a few minutes who she was exactly, and we found her obituary. So all these years as a creative, I try to figure out how can I thank my birth mom? What will I say to her when I meet her face to face? Mm -hmm. So I won't be able to do that. She passed away in 2010, but I will say that her courageous decision is causing these beautiful reverberations that will last for generations. And the most beautiful ones in my life mm -hmm are my kids, my wife, my family. So I thank her for her courageous decision. She went through 
all that incredible, unspeakable pain, but it was not in vain. Her decision was not in vain. Triumph can rise from tragedy, right? Mm. All the time. Do you know her story? You, she's a survivor of rape. She had you at 21. It sounds like she lived a short life. She died, as you said, in 2010. Do you know more about her story and her decision to place you for adoption? I don't know all the particulars. When I did my first search, the social worker gave me some of the details, and she told me things like she was a foster child herself who was estranged from her family. She served in the military, I know that. It was interesting as I read the obituary and it said, um, and it was weird to, to read this, it said she had no children, but she loved her pets. <laughs> I don't know why that sentence just hit me. Like she, she did have a child and Anyway, I, I don't know some of the particulars. I do know she also passed away from cancer, so that's why she passed away earlier than most. So it's interesting when you, you look at these, when you search some of your background, sometimes you know, it can be a happy story. Sometimes, I mean, for me, it is a happy story. I'm alive. I'm able to be loved. I'm able to love. I have you know, a wife that I love like crazy and four kiddos I love like crazy and an extended family that's, I don't know, numbering in the something where I'm like 82 or something like that. I kind of lost track. There are a lot of ex brothers and sisters and their, and their, their children. But it, her decision really just changed the trajectory of my life. I could have not existed, but instead I'm able to kind of, I don't know, do things that she never could have imagined, mm -hmm. that the child born out of that violence can actually rise up and extend love and compassion. It's amazing. And your family, your biological family, you're one of 15. And I think, yeah. if I'm doing the math correctly, 12 of whom are adopted. They had three bio kids? Three bio kids, 10, 10 were adopted. So we're 15 total. 10 were total. adopted, 15 right. total. Okay. And right. tell me more about your family growing up. And what kind of parents are these that are adopting all of these kids? It's amazing. My parents, first of all, Anyone who's ever had to raise 13 teenagers has to have a little something extra from God. But honestly, people will ask me, well, what moved your parents to adopt? And I think that's really important to, to lay out because my mom had this heart for adoption at a really young age, at the age of five. So my mom grew up with an alcoholic father. She grew up in a trailer park and her father was emotionally and psychologically abusive to her mom. So at the age of five, my mom went to a children's home for an entire year. This is your adoptive mom. This is, yeah. And she, for that one year's time, at the age of five, got that heart for adoption because she saw another little girl who had physical disabilities and no one came to visit her. At least my mom had her mom and her dad visit her separately, but no one came to see that little girl, to hold her, to, to hug her, to tell them that they loved her. And that broke a five-year-old's heart. And my mom describes it like this. She got down on her knees, asked Jesus into her heart during one of the, I guess it was some sort of service there. And she asked God to help her be a mommy to those who didn't have one. So God fulfilled that because it started with me and kept going. And so 10 adopted children later, uh, she met, by the way, my, my father is the most amazing man that I've ever known. My father is no longer with us. He actually passed away during the, the height of COVID. But my dad, I mean, when you hear people say pro-lifers don't care about people after they're born, that to me is one of the most ridiculous bumper sticker mantras. My parents obviously cared for people after they're born. I mean, adopting 10 children after already having three biological children. And in our house, I mean, we had kids who had such radically different beginnings, mm -hmm. tragic beginnings, physical violence and neglect, and yet loves changed those storylines. Our faith, my parents loved Jesus, and that natural outflow of loving Jesus is loving people, and they loved us. And so here, growing up in a family that <laughs> we'd walk around, people were wondering, is this a youth group? No, it's not a youth group. It's the Bomberger family. It was a testament to our community. It was a testament in our, in our church. Testament to so many who, the occasional newspaper article that would be written, my parents didn't do much of that at all. But it was a testament to the, the incredible transformational power of love. Mm -hmm. And my parents lived that out. And I thank God for their faith. I thank God for their endurance, for enduring me. I was a strong-willed child. I know you have two, two little ones. I don't know if any of them are stubborn-willed child, but children, but um, I was definitely, I, I think my first purpose in life was just to test my parents, just to see how far I could push them. They sound pretty with, tough, though. They parents. were tough. 
So yeah. they have all these children. You mentioned different storylines, and you mentioned abled and disabled and different ethnic backgrounds. Were they working with an adoption agency? Right. How did it come to the place where they were able to adopt so many of these kids? Right. And were they all different ages when they were adopted, or many of them, like yourself, adopted at just a few weeks old? Our family is all about variety. I mean, some were adopted as babies, some as toddlers, some as teens out of the foster care system. In fact, my parents almost gave up initially because adoption agencies wouldn't consider them because because they said, well, you already have children. But that's not the only reason why someone wants to adopt. But mom knew that you know God called her to adopt, and my dad had that same heart because, I mean, if you're gonna adopt 10 kids, you have to be on the same you know wavelength there. But they were initially rejected several times and had mm -hmm. almost given up before trying to adopt me. But their heart was really just to adopt children that just needed a home. They had no, you know, qualifications like, oh, it has to be this kind of child, it has to be a newborn, it has to be, so like, we want to adopt the children that I guess can't find a home. Amazing. And that's what they did. There was also a lot of opposition to place brown or mixed children or black children in white homes, which to me is just racism. Mm. The National Association of Black Social Workers, in fact, during that time decreed that no black child should ever be placed in a white home for any reason. So what's better, a child to languish in foster care? Because no child will ever say, hold on, I'll just wait an extra year or two until someone who has my same color can love me. No, they want to be loved by a mom and a dad. And I just thank God that our parents loved us regardless of our circumstances, loved us through a lot of these situations. And it's amazing when you see my siblings where they were and all the experts who said, well, this child's going to have to face this and this child won't amount to this. They were all wrong. I mean, over and over again just to see how, how wrong the experts are. And we have to remember that because I, I think sometimes head knowledge gets in the way of what the heart has seen and witnessed over and over again, and that is miracles happen all the time. Well, let's talk about that for a minute because I, this has a lot to do with, that has a lot of ramifications, the race question and debate today in this country about how kids are treated in foster care right. and when it comes to adoption. As you know, and you've spoken about many, many times at your ministry, Radiance Foundation, the abortion rate in the black community is sky high. You know, three to five times more likely a, a black woman to have an abortion than a white woman. Right. And there's all kinds of other conditions that make it harder for black and brown babies to be adopted, more at risk of abortion. Right. Talk to me about your view on adoption, foster care, and race. When we started the Radiance Foundation, we were based in Atlanta at the time. And so we decided to take two of the easiest topics possible, race and abortion, and combine them in a billboard campaign. And it was the first time we had dealt, actually it was the first public ad campaign dealing with the hugely disproportionate impact of abortion in the black community. And oh my gosh, we were not prepared for the insanity that followed. I mean, I was called all kinds of things and, you know, racist and... What did uh, your billboard say? It said, black children are endangered species, too many aborted.com. And of course, one is too many. And we were dealing with the hugely disproportionate impact of abortion. As you mentioned, the rate's three to five times higher. In New York City, for instance, where more black babies for years and years have been aborted than born alive. And so we were highlighting this and also kind of tying it to the fact that one branch of government decided that human life can be killed for any reason throughout the entire pregnancy, while another branch of government decided to protect animal life with the Endangered Species Act. So anyway, Planned Parenthood ended up coming up with what I call a crockumentary. It was a 20 minute documentary where they were praising themselves and talking about how abortion is so needed in the black community. And so that was an introduction into how bizarre for me it was that mainstream media had no interest in the facts. I remember New York Times calling us and saying, these numbers, these sound crazy, these sound conspiratorial was the word she used. I said, it's not conspiratorial, these are numbers from the CDC. I mean, this is not a mystery, it's not a myth that these abortion rates are higher. So when you talk about the issue of race, and we're in a day and age right now with critical race theory, um, which of course is just an extension of Marxism, critical theory, queer theory, you've got anti-racism, the whole anti-racism movement. and it's constantly separating us by the color of our skin. That's harmful when it comes to abortion. Of course, abortion is tragedy no matter the color of skin. But when it comes to adoption, that all of a sudden now, well, I shouldn't say all of a sudden because this has been a movement since the, the 70s in particular um, where the, the whole thought of transracial adoption, I'm saying, I'm putting that in quotes because we're all one human race, but it was frowned upon, frowned upon by National Association Association of Black Social Workers and other child welfare providers. And now it's, it's actually increasing 
So you've got, on one hand, they're saying no one wants to adopt these black and brown children, which is not true. On the other, other hand, they're also saying, um, you know, it's better for these children not to be born than to possibly go into the foster care system, to possibly have to face a life mm -hmm. of difficulty. You don't kill someone because they might face mm -hmm. difficulty in life. That's a ridiculous position to take. But now we're now in a place with adoption and foster care where color is preeminent. There's an accusation from some, and you could call it the maybe far left world, progressive world, that says that if a white family were to try to adopt a black child, that's a kind of colonialization. What's your response to that? Well, I remember when Justice Amy Coney Barrett was being confirmed, and of course this became a big deal, and you had the author of How to Be an Anti-Racist, uh, Ibram X. Kendi, whose name is actually Henry, but anyway, he called her white colonizer, and he actually accused them of white supremacy, and he accused them of having a savior complex, which is really a bizarre thing to even say. That's like, I guess he's also talking to my parents who happen to be white, that they had a savior complex. And this is coming from people who don't understand what adoption is. That adoption is an act of love, it's an act, act of rescue, and an act of redemption. So for him to say that people like just, just Amy Coney Barrett or my parents have a savior complex, he doesn't understand that they had a love reflex. Mm. Vastly different. But this is the whole thing about transracial adoption and the negative take that a lot of of prominent child welfare agencies now have. In fact, one of the nation's largest adoption agencies, Evangelical Adoption Agency, actually the largest one, Bethany Christian Services. I used to be a board mem member of their Atlanta chapter and the mm. Virginia chapter. They take that same position, that it's somehow now dangerous to place a black or brown child in a white home. And they're crying, it's this false cry, it's, it's this go-to boogeyman, you know, blame all, uh, white supremacy. So what's the alternative when there aren't enough black individuals or couples willing to adopt that somehow you have to be now the same color as somebody else in order to love them? I mean, how far does it go, right? Because color is not the only distinguishing characteristic right. between human beings, right? right? Why is that one that's being used? And even you said Bethany Christian Services yeah. is uh, deploying that, saying we're not going to place kids of color with white families. Right. Well, they say that it's dangerous. This is the same agency that now says it's okay to place um, children in same-sex same homes. So that's not So then they're, they're saying, in that <laughs> but, sense, they're saying color is more significant than sex, meaning yes. it's more important for you to be with someone of the same physical color as you than it is for you to have a mother and a father exactly. versus just two dads or two moms. Right. There's, there's no reason behind any of it. Of course, it's pure emotionalism. But, it, it, but where it's, does that come from? Because it's gripping society, this emphasis on color. Well, the emphasis on color is so destructive. And we've seen throughout human history, when we separate ourselves by color, it never works out well. And it certainly doesn't work out well when it comes to adoption. That's not putting the child's best interests at heart. The child needs a mother and a father. You, a child is in a, you know, that's in foster care is in a place of rescue, temporary rescue. And they need a you know, married mother and father who can bring that stability, bring that permanence, and of course love them. And when you have these, these ideologies, when you have these agencies clinging to a toxic worldview that somehow says, wait a minute, love. I mean, I find it interesting when you have simultaneously this whole thing about, you know, love has no parameters, love is love. And, well, but when it comes to color, somehow there is this barrier. Yeah. They hold to love is love, and then they say, wait a minute, there is a boundary here. And you know, I fight against that. I fight against that through the work I do in the Radiance Foundation. In my family, my, my, my wife is white. Our youngest son, Justice, is black. But she can't be his mother because and she can't love him the same way she would love a child of any other beautiful hue. I mean, you look at the history of the social, um, of social reform in this country and the civil rights movement, and just so much work. I mean, you know, sweat, blood, and tears being put into desegregating our schools. And the whole idea there is black and white children, the color of their skin should not matter when it comes to their friend groups and their school settings. And that should not define your life. It's your skin color. It's not your identity. And for them to, you know, now to, with adoption services to have this resegregation. Right. For families. I and again, I, these are cases, of course, I mean, because I think the, the um, opposition would say, or those that would fight for the segregation, you could say, in families, is saying, well, if they can be reunited with their biological families, that's ideal. 
And we, I do want to talk to you about that. But we're talking about cases where there's no way to do reunification for their biological family. What happens to that child? What ch family should that child be placed with? A family that's available, a family that's qualified and available. But instead, and I've seen case after case, in fact, in my own family, where being rejected because they're white and wanting to adopt a black child. And this is after, you know, for instance, uh, my oldest sister and her husband had already adopted a black child, but then they refused the next time saying that, <laughs> you know, they're not really qualified. What? Because of the color of their skin? So then instead, these children languish in foster care longer. In fact, the General Accounting Office, the GAO, has said that kinship care, because this whole push on reunification with, with the biological, it, it's, it's a good idea to an extent but it should not be the, the prevailing effort. And, and the reason for that is sometimes you, how long does it take to rehabilitate mm -hmm. someone, for instance, who may be addicted to drugs? Mm -hmm. and it's not to say that we don't continue to help bring that wholeness and healing, but in the meantime, what, what happens to that child? Do they wait one year, two years, three years? So instead, you know, they're bounced around kinship care, they go back to foster care, but it's much better for a child simply to be loved. Well, and in the first few years of childhood are so important. Right. I mean, that's where how you were cared for, how you were nurtured, the consistency and stability in the first few years, your early childhood has huge outcomes for later on in life. And so if those first few years are punctuated by separations, by uncertainties, by instability, because maybe you have a drug addicted parent, so you're being tossed around with the hopes to reunify them with that drug addicted parent in the future, that has real chaos for that kid. Right. And I think that's what your point is, right? Your point is that if there are biological families that there's a p potential for reunification and the priority is always reunification over the welfare of the child, then you're putting the adult's rights and interests before the kids. Right. And, and that's disastrous for the child. I mean, foster care, typically the reunification goal is over 50%. And I understand that to an extent, but not at the detriment of that child, those most formative years, as you mentioned, those earlier years, and then to, to then be pulled out of a situation, particularly a foster to adopt situation. I mean, it's devastating, not just for the child, it's for the family. And then what happens when, you know, the biological parent is still not able to parent the way that they, they should. I'm all about it. We have our youngest son. We we're so grateful for his birth mom. We're so grateful for so many. I mean, we, we now have an adoption fund where we are helping to fund other families adoption journeys. And a lot of these adoptions today are open adoptions, mm. but there are some cases where the birth parents aren't willing mm. and aren't able. Mm. But when it comes to foster care, man, I feel like we are putting children in harm's way and we are keeping them from having the stability and the permanence that they deserve. They don't need to go from dysfunction to dysfunction to dysfunction. They should go from dysfunction to healing. Mm. And that happens particularly in the context of a married mother and father, that's the best environment mm -hmm. for the, the child to, to grow up in. So the pro-abortion side literally uses you, <laughs> your case, your story, as a reason for why we need abortion on demand in America. You were conceived in rape, you were going to be adopted and raised by a family, what would happen to you, your parents were white, you're half black, and so because of the traumas that they say people like you endure, you should have never have existed. You know, it's such, especially post row, it is such a, it's like the typical narrative now that somehow, whoa, trauma, trauma, trauma. First of all, let's talk about trauma for just a moment. Trauma, and I can speak from, you know, personal experience in our family. I had siblings who come from really traumatic backgrounds. But see, trauma should be a reference point, not a resting place. And that's often what happens when they talk about this trauma. And Simone Biles from, I think, was it two years ago, the world's most decorated gymnast, who went on Instagram and talked about how she's, she's pro-choice and, and that a child shouldn't have to experience the trauma of foster care and that kind of separation. She was in foster care. She was rescued. She was adopted and loved. She is actually the tangible example of what we call the Radiance Foundation, the beauty of possibility. Mm -hmm. She was loved and rescued, yet she has a pro-abortion mentality, which is so sad and so tragic because it reinforces this pro-abortion lie that somehow you're better off dead. I was adopted out of the foster care system and most of my siblings were. We weren't better off mm -hmm. dead. We were better off loved. Yes. You know, I was actually direct messaging with Simone around the time of her comments because when she came out saying she was pro-choice and she's this like amazing and beautiful example of the power of choosing life 
And she comes out basically saying that there should be a choice, legal and supported, to kill girls like her before birth. And so I, I was commenting on this on Instagram, I think, and ended up DMing with her a little bit. And she actually seemed like she was open to talking and she said she'd be happy to chat. And then after a few back and forth, you know, she said she was gonna do a call, we're gonna do a call ghosted, you know, gone. And I think it's because she's, I'm going to guess, surrounded by a lot of people who are very pro-abortion. And so they're influencing her and saying, listen, don't talk to the pro-lifers, you know, don't don't even go there. You have to be pro-choice. And there's this like group thing today right. when it comes to kids conceived in violence, kids with disability, kids in foster care, that death is better than life for them. Right. But they don't think about it as like death. They think about it in terms of just like non-existence is better. Right. I think at the heart of it, it's this lack of, of appreciation for the possibility of life. Right. It's, it's a hopelessness. It is, and it's not compassionate to say, oh, well, this child shouldn't exist because they might face you know, poverty. Well, greatness has arisen out of poverty. I mean, look at Dr. Penn Carson. Mm -hmm. He had a single mom who worked multiple jobs, and he and his brother you know, achieved a whole lot. Why? Because they had a driven woman, a driven mom. And we have a culture that just says, hey, women give up, which is weird. Because on one hand, women are everything. Women are, are, are strong. Women, you know, what, what was the hashtag several years ago? The future is female. But yet somehow when it comes to the unplanned, somehow when, when it comes to things that are difficult, they're not strong enough. And I think the difference is, especially in our movement, is we're always speaking that hope. Mm. We're always speaking that resilience into people. We believe that we're stronger than our circumstances. You know, for me, Philippians 4.13, you know, it doesn't say I can do some things through Christ who strengthens me. No, it says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so when people have this, this narrative, and I hear this sometimes even in churches, well, it would be better off for someone not to suffer. We cannot eliminate suffering. As Christians, we work to, to eliminate it. We work to reduce it. But as long as humankind exists, suffering will always exist. But what's the compassionate, loving thing to do is to be that resource of help, be that resource of hope, not to violently eliminate someone because mm. you decided that their value is less. Eliminate the suffering, not the sufferer. Right. Exactly. To kill the person who's hurting is not compassionate. It never is. It never will be. So what would you say to, I mean, we're in the post-Dobbs, post-Roe v. Wade world right now, and we are living in a culture of, I would just say, chaos and confusion. Yeah. I mean, on the one hand, we're saying, you know, there's almost, it's almost glamorized to have mental illness today and to have struggles and everyone's wearing their struggles on their sleeve. On the other hand, we're saying people who struggle so much, it's better they never existed. Um, and so there's so much confusion around what it even means to be human. Right. What's your response? You have this beautiful ministry that is messaging every day, not just on abortion, but on race issues, on parenting. What, what's your message to the chaos? Well, we believe that every human life has purpose. You know, whether you're planned, unplanned, able, disabled, every human life has God-given purpose. And our worth, and this is such, it's an interesting, interesting thing with a country that is veering so far off of Judeo-Christian um, foundational values. We don't have that same mooring anymore. And because we're unanchored from that, you have this hopelessness, you have this meaninglessness. In fact, we're living in a culture right now where you can't even have a, a a conversation uh, a, that you can even understand each other because the words are being changed all the time. I mean, look at the conversations about sexuality. You, know, you have a Supreme Court justice who can't tell you what a woman is, really? While at the same time, she's saying we need more black women on the Supreme Court. Well, what is that? If you don't even, you can't even define what a woman is. Why do we need something more of what you don't understand? So well, it's, it's funny too. If you're a man, you can identify as a woman, but if you're one race, it is actually a, a huge cultural sin to identify as another race. Right. Rachel so, Dolezal. But she it, got the raw end of that stick. I mean, she, she got beat down because she was a white woman, you know, the, the NAACP president mm -hmm. chapter. Right. But it, chapter I think, president. I mean, it is silly. It is wrong to claim that you are something that you're not in right. terms of your physicality. Like, be be yourself. You know, whatever sex or color or whatever background you've been given, be that. And it's beautiful, right? That's the power of diversity and the beauty of diversity. And it's, you know, for a, a culture that talks so much about diversity and prizes diversity, which is a beautiful thing. I think that's a good thing. Yes, definitely. It's crazy how these anti-diversity forces are now at play, but they're the same ones who use the language of diversity. 
They do, and it's not really diversity. I mean, diversity, equity, what was it? Diversity, equity, inclusion, and, inclusion. and then equ equity. But they realized that that acronym spelled die. So they reversed it and said diversity, equity, and inclusion. But the problem with all of that is oftentimes they don't want, they want superficial diversity. Um, they don't want total inclusion because if you don't adhere to their ideology, you don't belong. And then equity is just garbage. I mean, equity is not about equality. It would be like saying, well, black people have suffered so much. So in our track meet today, all the black people get to be, you know, half the half the track ahead because we have to make up for all the wrongs. I mean, it, it's such an insane approach, but it's all of this confusion about who we are. It's all this confusion about what we want to be. Um, and the fact that like, I you hear the word authentic all the time, just be your authentic self. And in this culture, um, you can't really, especially when it comes to issues of sexuality, it's not about being your authentic self, it's about being your altered self. Or it's about living just by what you desire. Like your desires, there should be no directing of your desires, but if you have sort of any kind of sexual desire or attraction, or even if you, it's not even a sexual thing, you have some sort of deep attraction or connection, then that becomes sexualized sometimes, right? right. Or just any sexual desire you should be able to explore and it's good. Um, you know, if I ate every single piece of pie that looked good, I'm sure that wouldn't be, be healthy. So it's right. like, just because you're desiring of something doesn't mean that you need to go and get it. Right. So that's part of the confusion of the day. Right. But that confusion is all tied to the fact that we don't know who we are. Mm -hmm. And as a Christian, you know, I believe if our identity is rooted in Christ, it won't be uprooted by everything else. And so all this confusion and this whole thing, well, I just want to be this, because you're so unsatisfied mm -hmm. about who you actually are, that you're so desperate for meaning and you're just bouncing around from one thing to the other to the other and it's just self-destruction. Mm -hmm. And it's so heartbreaking to me as, as a father, you know, a father of four, I want my kids to so firmly understand who they are. You know, the world's constantly saying, you have to identify as this, 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 and this. And I want them to understand, look, identify first who you are in Christ. Mm -hmm. And the other stuff is superfluous. I mean, and it always changes with culture. You know, they're, they're, they're mixed like I am. You know, they could identify at all these things, but the world is saying, no, 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 you have to be this, you have to be that, you have to be... All that is confusing, and I want them to actually know who they are, because when this, this you know, we had this moral tsunami washing mm. over us, I don't want them to be moved. Mm. And so that confusion that we see in our culture and that hopelessness and that genderlessness, which leads to meaninglessness, the only way to counter that is to reassure kids who they are who they are created in the image of, mm. not a celebrity, <laughs> right? Know, not not some you know music artist, not some you know academic whatever, but they're made in the image of God, mm. and I and I want my kids to know that, and not just my kids. I want all kids mm. to understand that, so that they can understand that they have intentional purpose in their lives. And that's a big heart behind Radiance Foundation, especially is reaching out and educating younger people, especially kids, children. So you've written children's books. Yeah. Tell me about your books, your children's books. See, my wife, Bethany, is, has been a teacher. She taught in public and private school for 13 years, and her last three years were in Philly. In fact, I don't know if you know this, but it, her last three years in Philly, on Tuesdays, she was a math teacher. She, she hates math. <laughs> she, children's lit is her thing. She loves children's literature. But every Tuesday, Planned Parenthood activists would come in. they get the whole class for 45 minutes to, you know, spread their misinformation. And she, as the teacher in a public school, had to sit there and just be quiet. And the only way that she could say anything is after the activists were, were done with their 45 minutes, that if a student asked a question, she could address it. But that was, it was so insane. And that was her first introduction into what happens, the indoctrination that happens. And these are mostly urban schools. People don't realize this. A lot of these school-based healthcare clinics, which increased in massive funding through Obamacare, have these Planned Parenthood activist sessions in school, during school time. But my wife's passion for children's lit is really what led us to creating our own publishing company mm -hmm. called Borrow Publishing. Borrow means creating something out of nothing, mm -hmm. which when we started Radiance Foundation, we definitely, <laughs> God help us create something out of nothing. We had no money, we knew nobody, and things have changed so much. We love where God has brought us, but we have this passion to talk about these really tough culture-shaping issues, but in a way that that children can understand. And actually adults can learn from it too. So our first book was called Pro-Life Kids. We love that one. Live action store. <laughs> Check it out, guys. <laughs> it, it's, you know, it's written by my favorite author, uh, Bethany Bomberger. So <laughs> thank you guys for carrying it. She's, 
it, it, and it's so adorably illustrated. And one of the sections in the book says the, the 10 ways that you can become, or the 10 ways you can be a pro-life kid. And it's amazing because actually adults can follow some of those suggestions and figure out how they can get involved in their community. But What are some of those things? Well, just even understanding, being kind mm -hmm. to, to someone, because the book is meant for kids two to eight mm -hmm. primarily. Um, being kind, it talks about how they can actually support their local pregnancy center. They do these, you know, these diaper um, drives and and some, some of them do maternity clothes drives. And there are ways that little kids can be involved in their local pregnancy center, going to their local um, or their city March for Life or the National March for Life. So those are some of the suggestions for kids to get involved. But in this book, it also has a section that says real life pro-life kids and what they're doing. And it's really inspiring stories of little kids ages you know, three, four, seven, nine, and, and, and older, and how they're being pro-life in their community. But we love these books because it's such a powerful way. Children's Lit is such an amazing way to talk about really tough topics and get them across in powerful ways to young children. I mean, the left understands this. That's why they target them with every issue known under the sun, except from a really toxic perspective. Well, you walk into Barnes and Nobles today, or a lot of just, I mean, I'm in California, so a lot of like boutique type bookstores, and I see these books that are just targeted towards kids that are highly political right. um, in the left, to the left direction, you know, pro-abortion content, you know, pro-LGBTQ type content, right. um, you know, woke type content, and there's no alternate voice. It's like lockstep one way as if the whole public believes this way when it absolutely doesn't. Right. It ignores, you know, most people. And But I just see so much of that. Why do you think that is? Oh, well, where, are, where are the stories in the books on our side and why aren't more stores carrying them? Well, one, because there is, a, I mean, there's a, there's a hatred toward our perspective. I mean, Christianity has always dealt with this kind of venomous sort of mm. uh, thing. I mean, Jesus said in, in, in his word, you will be hated for my name's sake. And he wasn't kidding. <laughs> but we have the ability, particularly when we create good art, mm. to get these things. Like you go to, into a Target and they're, tons of these children books and they're also highly politicized which i find funny because they say well you shouldn't introduce this topic some christian parents you shouldn't introduce these topics to young kids the left is mm -hmm. the lost are why wouldn't we want to do that and you mentioned the woke which is interesting because that's not a new term people think it's relatively new it's actually from mm -hmm. i guess you know even back in the 1920s 1940s was used but it was about um, facing justice it was particularly used by those who were fighting for civil rights those of my complexion and then it was kind of rekindled during the Ferguson fight when it said, stay woke. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about that is stay woke, stay informed, stay alert. But yet the things that are woke today are some of the most uninformed things, particularly these books about sexuality. Well, I mean, that's the thing. Basic science. The term, I mean, it's, a, it's interesting because like even the term pro-choice, right? They took, they hijacked the word choice because choice, I believe it's one of the most beautiful things that makes us uniquely human is our ability to reason, our ability to choose. and But to choose to kill a child and that to be legal and accepted, no, that's not my right to do that, right? And similar with the word woke, I mean, the idea about being awake to injustice is a beautiful idea that right. actually we're both fighting for. You know, you've right. spent your whole career fighting for that. Uh, but the term woke has been now highly politicized for a particular far left ideology that also has to do with promoting sexual deviancy to kids and other things have just kind of been wrapped up under the woke label, and so that's why there's a reaction against it. Um, what's your position on the, the term woke? I mean, do you think that there's good woke? <laughs> I, I just think truth is a better word to embrace, because <laughs> the whole thing about woke is anything that truly is, and those who are self-described as woke are typically the ones who are spreading the most misinformation. Do you think we can take the term back, though? Because the original use of it was it. a good thing, right? I don't no. want it. I don't want to be woke. I want to be awakened. And I think most people see that difference. I don't know. There's some things where a word is just so corrupted. It's like, just leave it alone. <laughs> or, you know what I mean? Sometimes it just needs to be thrown away. Because um, th the problem is we have, especially, okay, we both speak in college campuses. And the amount of ignorance, and I'm not, I'm not saying that in a malevolent way, but the, the amount of just lack of awareness of things because they're given such a singular perspective is so unbelievable, but yet they think that they're woke. They think their eyes are wide open and they're not. I mean, just getting a contrary perspective sends people into this, you know, this crazy apoplectic sort of reaction because how dare you 
present a different opinion? How dare you present a different perspective? But I think there's so much confusion there because we all agree, we agree racism is wrong, you know, obviously. And so there's- you and I agree? Yes, we agree that racism nice. is wrong. But I think that the, the typical kind of, you know, lefty college kid or whatever, who hears some maybe conservative speaker coming in there and saying that they're anti-woke is saying, well, you're a racist because you're against being awake to injustice that, you know, injustices. So I can kind of see the thread of logic there from their perspective. Now they're not seeing that wokeism is not just, you know, maybe originally it was designed to be against racial, real racial injustice. Right. And then today it's come on to create this whole ideology around many, many other things that are beyond right. its original intent. But how would you explain that to that average college kid? How do you explain it? You speak on college campuses. Right, and sometimes it's fun, sometimes it's <laughs> insane. But the problem that I see on these college campuses is that students are being taught to fear, not to think. Mm. And so it's really hard to even have you know civil conversations because the moment you say something that's contrary to their own opinion, you're you know you're a bigot, you're a misogynist, mm. you're a, you're transphobic, you're a racist, which renders those words meaningless. I mean, I, I remember I was speaking at the University of Louisville, and it was the, the theme was on reproductive justice. I hate those words because. <laughs> You know, there's no justice being done to the child who has been produced. But anyway, one of the teachers in of the school, and the, it was in, I think it was called the Red Barn. So the the, the um, auditorium was packed out, and the teacher yelled, "Well, you're just an Uncle Clarence. You're just an Uncle Tom." <laughs> I thought, "Oh, here we go." And she happened to be African American, black woman, and I thought that's so interesting. I said, "Have you read Uncle Tom's Cabin?" Because if you're calling me the guy who enabled others to be set free, and that's that's somehow a put down? Yeah, that, I'm an Uncle Tom. Had she for read life. Uncle Tom's Cabin? I don't think she had. I mean, because just the fact that she was using those terms and trying to diminish Clarence Thomas, trying to diminish um, you know, the the main the protagonist in the book, mm -hmm. racism is such an easy, lazy pejorative. It's an easy, lazy charge. And that's what people are relying on. But it means what does it even mean anymore? I'll give you an example. I saw, I read in the, the College Fix where now um, soap dispensers mm. are racist. Did you know that? Mm. They're racist because you have to turn the light side of your hand up in order to receive the soap. Mm. What does racism even mean anymore? I mean, if somehow your soap dispenser in your bathroom is now a racist device. Well, it's a real, it's a great cultural conceit to be distracting people with things that are nonsense right. while we're committing atrocities on 2,500 children every day and slaughtering them legally. Right. I mean, think about all the uproar over, okay, a man is can be a woman now and how dare you prevent this man from walking into a woman's restroom. You are evil, you are a bigot versus the child today that was just murdered down the right. street at you know 26 weeks old, uh, dismembered, horrific pain, and that's legal, and you didn't say a word about that. In fact, you support that, and meanwhile, you're saying the injustice is over here because a man can't walk into a woman's bathroom. I mean, right, that's, that's where we've gotten culturally. Well, it's narcissism. That is our national religion. It's narcissism. I remember when I spoke at Wheaton College and I did the presentation called Black Lives Matter In and Out of the Womb, at the end of this presentation, a group of, of students who of, of my complexion were, some of them were weeping. They were so upset that I didn't support the Black Lives Matter movement, which is radically pro-abortion, which stands in solidarity with Planned Parenthood, that thinks Christianity is oppression. This is a Christian college and they're weeping because I don't actually stand with Black Lives Matter. But the insanity was they themselves said they were the ones who were victimized. I'm like, wait a minute, you're, this whole presentation was about the actual victims that is the nearly one million that are killed each year in our country. And somehow you turn this into you being the victim, but that's because we have a nation that is bowing at the altar of narcissism, that everything is about them. And the actual victims of injustice, it's easy to ignore because I'm going through something right now. Well, can we talk about the ones who are most victimized and can we do the most that we can to stop that victimization? It, it really does blow my mind the, the me-centeredness of our culture. And I have four kids. I mean, they're, they're almost all teenagers, 12, 14, 15, and, and 18. Teenagers can be a little self-obsessed sometimes. I love my kids like crazy. But as a parent, we're constantly trying to direct them mm -hmm. to, like my wife has this acronym, JOY, Jesus, Others, You. And understanding that we're not the first thing mm -hmm. all the time. I mean, there are times when you obviously have to take care of yourself, but I'm saying that 
to, to fix your eyes on the needs of others is not a natural thing. It's something you have to constantly reinforce. And we live in a culture right now that's me, 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 and the actual injustice, the actual violence, the actual devastation can mm. just be ignored while me is at is, you know, center stage. And that's, that's the tragedy mm. that we're trying to dismantle mm. <laughs> through what we do through the Radiance Foundation, getting others to understand that you know, a culture that focuses on the sacrifice of others is not a strong culture. It's not a strong society. Self-sacrifice is what elevates all of us. Do you have a story of somebody who has heard your story, seen some of your work, and had a change in their mindset on abortion? Oh Tell me word. some of those stories. Oh, my word. I think my favorite part of when I travel and I speak is just afterward, <laughs> where I get to hear other people's stories. One of the I mean, there's so many. First of all, I ugly cry, so it doesn't, it doesn't take much to get me to cry. One of the most powerful times was when I spoke at a pregnancy center banquet, a fundraiser, and this elderly gentleman who was in his 70s came up to me, had served the military, and he said, I've never heard a story like yours. Because I came in here and I thought, I came in here because I understood what your story was, and I just wanted to walk out of here with that same sort of perspective. He says, I can't, I can't walk out of here. Because the moment you opened your mouth and you shared your story, this, this hardened military guy had his heart just like broken open. Because I can't even leave here having that same sort of mentality. Because then I love you for that. And he, gave, he gives me this like big hug. And I find that funny because I'm thinking, God, how does my story translate to, like, for instance, I spoke at a church with their former gang members. And I'm thinking, I am. I wasn't in a gang, I grew up on a farm. I mean, how, how is my story going to you know, resonate with someone who was a former gang member? And this is the thing I just remind people, never underestimate how God can use your story, mm -hmm. how God can use your vulnerability, he can use your obedience. Mm -hmm. I spoke at that, that church and afterward, these kids in their you know, late teens, early 20s, I mean, one after the other after the other coming up and crying and hugging me and thanking me because I reminded them that their life has purpose. I mean, it, Lila, it's like over and over again, I, I see this kind of thing happening. Mm -hmm. I think part of it is because my story, and I'm so glad that God enables me to tell my story, but it's so disarming to people. Mm -hmm. Remember I spoke at University of Florida and I had students who came in. <laughs> it, it was funny. Afterward, they said, we wanted to hate you when you came in. We wanted to hate you. Said, but we, we just never heard things from your perspective. Mm -hmm. Never knew of anybody who was conceived in rape. Mm -hmm. And you changed our minds. That was just two students. I mean, it was there were hundreds there, but it was two. But that's what matters. Sometimes it's just one, sometimes it's two. But there have been many instances where people have said, oh my goodness, I never thought of, that, thought of it this way. But that's why it's important for us when we have stories to tell, to tell them because mm -hmm. we take things from the abstract and make them so beautifully tangible for people. So it's no longer something that's easy to reject when it's just this sort of nebulous idea. Mm -hmm. But that's a real life flesh and blood person mm -hmm. who grew up in a family of 15, who has a wife and four kids and has been a mentor to teens and has done all these, these things for these organizations. And oh my gosh, okay, so maybe that life isn't worthless. Mm -hmm. And you haven't had the easiest road. I mean, I think this is where people maybe get it's hard for people to comprehend that the good and the, the struggle can exist besides with each other. Right. You know, they can coexist. That life isn't always one dimensional. That there are tough times in your life, right. and that there are good times, and that God can bring beauty and good even out of the toughest moments. I mean, you've shared before that you've struggled with depression, right. and can you share more about that? and how that's impacted your perspective and your work. Yeah, oh wow, well, it impacted me. I, you know, I'm a creative professional. I worked in the ad agency world. I, I love creating stuff. I love writing, I love designing, music, singing, all these things. And for a long time I felt like it was kind of a curse because I never quite understood what I was supposed to do mm -hmm. in life. And this is even going through grad school. But it was at that point that I was in, the, in this band, lead singer in this band called Surreal. And there was a planning meeting for a pregnancy center banquet, a fundraiser. And so we were leading that fundraiser. And so there was this planning meeting and that's where my wife, Bethany and I first met. I remember seeing her for the first time. I was like, oh, okay, 
who is that? And she thought the same thing. In fact, she, she tells the story. She leaned to her roommate, who was also part of that meeting, and said, he doesn't have a ring on his finger. Oh, my gosh. And she's like, I'm not like that. That's not who I am. We fell in love at first sight. However, I didn't realize what I was going through at that time, and it was a depression that because I allowed the lies to continue, you know, we're told by Scripture and Scripture to hold every thought captive, not to let it lounge around, <laughs> um, not to let it hold you captive, and that's what I allowed it to do. And Which thoughts? What, when you, what do you mean by that? Uh, self-worth. Um, were there struggles with your upbringing or with your adoption? No, mm -hmm. there wasn't. In fact, that's what kept me from not completely falling apart. I was loved like crazy. It wasn't that. I, I actually feel like it was something I felt in the womb from day one, the self-rejection, uh, who I was, the perfectionism I used to... I became a you know workaholic because everything had to be perfect at work, at school. Um, so I excelled in all these things, but it was taking a toll on me. And so it was this depression that, you know, I wasn't, you know, I, I would actually entertain a lie. I wasn't meant to be. And my older sister, Corinne, who would call me just to check in on me over and over again to make sure that I was okay, which is important. It's important for family and f family members and friends to stay tuned or stay in tune with what's going on with someone. But it really was that care that also kind of kept me from the suicide ideation. I remember I would drive home from work and there's a bridge you had to go, long bridge you had to go over. And I look at the, every time I drove over that bridge, I kept thinking, I'm just gonna drive off the bridge. I'm just gonna drive off the bridge. And it's amazing because when you're in a dark place, one, you keep feeding that darkness which is what I was doing. I was feeding darkness with darkness. I would sometimes not even leave the house I was living in. I was just renting a room. I was actually a grad student, you know, shortly after getting my master's degree. And I wouldn't leave the room for days at a time. I would cancel meetings and then finally muster up enough whatever to kind of put on a show and then I would go right back into that darkness. And that's why when I would hear people give testimony at churches, I would be like, you know what? You're going to be a wreck. You're going to be a mess, you know, next week or the... The, the day after, not thinking that deliverance was real. Mm -hmm. And when I went through it, I remember I was crossing this bridge and I was listening to this song called I Will Be Free. It's by older Christian music artist, Cindy Morgan. And I had sung those lyrics so many times. And I just, and I just kept thinking, I wish, I wish those words could be, me, could be me. I will be free, I'll be free to run the mountains. I'll be free, free to drink from the living fountain. Um, I will not rest because he waits for me. I will be free. And I thought, I wish that could be me. And so every time I drive home from work, I'm like, oh, am I going to drive off? going to drive off. And this particular time, I'm sit listening to this song as I'm going over that particular bridge. And something just clicked, snapped, whatever. I felt this release. And I kept singing the, the words and I kept singing it. And the, the drive home was probably 15 minutes. So I probably sang the song three or four times. And each time I just felt like it was louder and each time I felt like it was truer. I got home and I felt like I hadn't felt that way in years. Like I didn't feel that darkness. I didn't feel that oppression. I went in our backyard because my buddy who owned the house had this massive trampoline and I just kept jumping up and down because that's how I felt like inside. I called my sister and I was weeping. She's like, are you okay? I'm like, I'm fine, I'm fine. In fact, I think I'm back. I, I don't even know. And I was screaming, I was laughing. I put up these Bible verses in my room because I wanted to remind myself of what was true. And I didn't want to forget because I was, I was so scared that I would go back to that same place. I never did. Never did. And that's why that, as I, you know, I was mentioning earlier, that pursuit back to Bethany because I loved Bethany. I had been looking for Bethany in all these other girls that I dated, which wasn't a lot of other women. It was just a handful. But... I would sit in, during a date and I'm like, oh, I wish that were Bethany, but it's not Bethany. And it was because I was free that I could pursue her. And thankfully she welcomed me. So it was, it was rooted in, you believe, this um, kind of existential crisis you had and the depression you experienced in that early experience, even in the womb, of being rejected. Did, did your birth mother consider abortion or more that your birth mother wasn't able to mother you? I don't know whether she considered abortion. She certainly had the option to have an abortion, but I did have the blessing of actually speaking with the caseworker mm -hmm. that worked with my birth mother. 
And in speaking with that caseworker, and this is a story too that they relayed to my parents, that she, she was very angry, obviously and understandably, throughout her pregnancy. And then when I was born, she definitely did not want to see me. But the caseworker said, the moment that I was born, she asked to be able to see me and to hold me. Mm -hmm. And so she felt like something broke in her so I can imagine when we talk about the things that a baby feels inside a mother's womb, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot that's going on in utero that we don't even fully understand. But I think part of it was me feeling that rejection, feeling that anger, because I didn't get it from my family. I, I was not rejected by my family. I was loved like crazy. I couldn't really explain it. All I know is I was in it. It was deep. I thought I was going to have to be medicated, which was weird because I had a roommate at the time who was going through depression, and so he was on medication, he ended up gaining like 80 pounds. I'm like, oh, that's gonna make me less depressed. What is going on here? So I thought, this is terrible. If, if This is my only outlet, but it was a spiritual deliverance driving home from work one day, and oh my gosh, if everything that I had been feeling for years and years was just gone. Gone overnight, I have never experienced depression a single day since. And that's what led me on the road back to Bethany. Wow. Because I was a different person. I was a whole person. And I felt like I could be the husband that she deserved to have, not someone who was so broken that she was going to constantly have to pick mm -hmm. me up. And so I've never experienced that depression since then. Wow. So it took me a little while. That's why I got married later on in life at, shall I say the age, 35. Very young, Ryan. Yeah, I know. Do you think the depression you talked about, your mother being angry, and she had a right to be angry. She was a survivor of rape. I mean, she was violated in the worst way. And now she's pregnant and she's struggling and she's only, you know, she's young. And so do you think your depression too was the questions you're having about your biological father? Like, who is this person? I mean, was that underlying somewhere? Or maybe that didn't cross your mind. Could have been. I mean, it, he could have been struggling too. Maybe. Uh, who knows what struggle led him to carry out such a heinous act against mm -hmm. another human being. It's, it's interesting because I actually don't think a lot about my biological father. Mm -hmm. And now that I did this whole, and I know my ancestry, it's possible that I could even be connected to him. And all I've ever wanted my whole life was actually to connect to her. Mm -hmm. I never even thought about him or what you know, we, we believe in, the, in, as far as being spiritual, you know, we're spiritual beings and that we understand certain things. I'm not responsible for the sins of my mm -hmm. father. I am not mm -hmm. the rapist child. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I was God's child. And I'm Henry and Andrea Bomberger's son and love like crazy. Mm -hmm. And it was because of that faith, that was what kept me mm -hmm. afloat. Mm -hmm. It really was because honestly, I, I would have probably have ended things had I not at mm. least had that foundation to constantly return to. I wish I could sit down with your adoptive parents, with Mr. and Mrs. Baumberger, because that feat of raising so many kids, 13 kids, and to what, passionately love them and all these different things going on, you know, families, family traumas of origin with the, with the adopted kids, it's a lot. You're an Emmy Award winning artist, creator. What's your process? Oh, prayer. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of prayer, because honestly, trying to figure out some of these complex things and how to distill them down to something simple, I, I just, I feel like they're divine downloads, honestly. I try to figure out, okay, God, how can I talk about this issue? And because, one, I was inspired by my mom, I have to give credit to my mom. She's the reason why I love wordsmithing. She's the reason why I love to read. But a lot of it is, I will jump into research. I want to understand the context of any issue. Because when you know context, I think it's, well, especially if you know the other side and their position, you know the other side's questions, it's easier to craft something that actually speaks to them as well. And so I do a lot of, thousands of hours of research, just digging deep, and then I try to take this stuff and then have it, you know, something that's digestible, my wife says, something that's digestible. And so, in creating, I mean, I'm, I'm a motion graphic designer. I've done that for broadcast design. I've done jingles for radios, I for radio programs. And I, I, I create all this stuff, but the process really is first understanding mm -hmm. what the, the, to the totality of the issue is. Then I can speak to that. And then it's a matter of, okay, 
well, here's the first iteration. Okay, that was terrible. Or maybe that was a little too sarcastic because I do love sarcasm. I believe in speaking the truth in love with a dash of sarcasm. So sometimes I have to pull out some of the sarcasm. But in my process, I'm always thinking about, is this ultimately going to point someone to God? And that's a challenge, especially when you're speaking to a secular world. I want to create something that doesn't rely on religious language necessarily, depending on, on what the project is, but also something that will vertically point them, you know, upward. So the process is, it's always trial and error. I mean, if you saw some of the first iterations of some of the things I do, but that's why I consider so many things divine downloads, because I don't have a lot of time to create. And that's why I'm like, okay, thank you, God, for that inspiration. Thank you for, you know, just speaking that. You know, one of the one of the um, graphics I created said, you know, it's not your truth, it's not my truth, it's just the truth. And I remember high school students saying, oh, yeah. And I'm thinking, that really shouldn't be that powerful. Truth doesn't need a qualifier. Truth is constant. And that's why in my creative process, I think the constant that is, is that truth finds a way into my design in a way that just, I feel like makes sense. And I know the result of that because I get the feedback. Mm. I get the feed. I mean, sure, I get some of the hate from, yeah. from you know, the plenty of haters out there, but I get a lot of great response from people saying, thank you. I didn't know how to talk about that. I didn't know how to, how to even start that conversation, but that graphic you made or that video you made or your op-ed, it helped me understand how I can talk about this with my, you know, my son, my daughter, my, my coworker. And so it's some of that feedback that I'm like, okay, I think the process worked. But it's a continual process mm -hmm. because you know we're living in culture now that is is isn't is, was isn't was. So it's getting even harder because the language itself is is so volatile. It's like changing all the time. But that's why we have to be persistent in what we're doing. And love is persistent. I mean, evil is relentless. We know that. Evil never sleeps. Well, God and good don't either. Where can people find out more about your work, Ryan? People can just go to radiance.life. That's R-A-D-I-A-N-C-E dot life. That's the easiest way to get to us. Currently, we're on social media, but you just never know. The whole <laughs> landscape changes all the time. But we're really excited about the content that we have there, and we're going to be creating a lot more content to equip people to be fearless and engaging and helping to shift our culture. Thank you. You do an awesome job, and I'm excited to see all the great things to come. Thank Check you. out Ryan's stuff. and. Hopefully we'll have Bethany out here sometime soon too. I better have. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan.